Hello and welcome back to Friday Mimics. Now, as programmers, we love our shortcuts. And today, what we're gonna do is we're gonna talk about a pretty classic shortcut that has some pretty mysterious roots. That would be the fast inverse square root function. Now, before we jump into this, we need to talk a little bit about the square root operation in and of itself. While it is a function that we use fairly often, as it turns out, it's kind of non-trivial to implement. If you realize you went through things like algebra, etc. in school, and even though you were trained to use the square root function, you were never really thought how that function actually works. If you had to do it yourself, then it's only done in you know, very primitive, very simple situations. And if you had to do it on a more complex number, you always had a calculator handy. So what is square root and how does it actually work? As it turns out, the proper way to calculate a square root is iterative in nature. What this means is there are many steps to it. You've got to do something with the result to do something else, so on and so forth. So this could pose a problem. When we're dealing with things that, you know, either are pretty slow in terms of their computational power, or if they're limited in terms of their RAM, so they couldn't store that much, we would want to avoid doing some operation like that, which is complex, it takes time, it may take memory as well. But we've got square roots everywhere, from our pocket calculators to, well, even our primitive consoles and game systems, they're able to perform that operation. And the reason why they can do it is, well, not because they go through that complex process, but because they use some form of estimation. In fact, the ways to deal with this is you could either have a lookup table, which is a pre-computed set of values that you pull from and transform, or you could use some kind of estimation to have a formula that is close enough, as good as it gets. And in fact, the fast inverse square root is one such example. It is an approximation, but the cool thing about this method is that it uses several interesting techniques. What you're seeing here is a version of the code that I've rewritten slightly, you know, clean things up a little, uh, based on the actual original code. And the reason why I wanted to bring this particular approach to your attention is because of how it actually approaches the problem, by essentially using a whole series of hacks, a bunch of different hacks that magically creates the correct result, or, well, something close enough. This code actually came from the Quick Engine. Being a 3D graphics engine, it needs to compute this a lot, in fact many times to render just a single frame, so it must do things really quickly. And essentially this function actually gives you the inverse of the square root, so 1 over the square root of a number. I'm not going to go into the mechanics of how everything works here, in fact some of these are kind of shrouded in mystery, but we'll go through the steps one by one, just to see the ingenuity of how this method actually works. So. This method starts off by taking in your input and converting it from float to long. Yeah, that's weird already because essentially it takes a decimal number which is represented to a computer in a certain pattern and it basically turns it on its head. It says, let's throw out that particular interpretation. Instead, let's just treat it as a bunch of bits, treat it as a numerical value. And in other words, the value actually represented within the variable completely changes. This is no longer anything remotely resembling the original number. It's a completely different thing now. In this new form, we first perform a bit shift. Treating the value as just a bunch of bits, well, we shift them. We get rid of one bit from the very end and everything moves towards the right. And then, this is the part that, you know, sort of makes it really, really strange. You do a subtraction with this strange magic number. Now, in software engineering terms, a magic number is a number that has come out of nowhere, and I think this is a great example of this because what even is this? Of course, there are some explanations for what this number actually does, but well, again, we don't have the time to get into this. But yeah, essentially what's happening here in this step is we are doing a subtraction, right? We will take this number, we'll subtract i from it, and yeah, this actually helps us get an approximation of the result. This number obviously has to be set up strategically, but looking at this function on its own, well, again, it's magic. We have no idea where that came from. Once we're done with this, 
the value, remember it is still a long, right? It was still treated as, well, not a decimal value. When we're done with that, now we change it back to float. We change it back to a decimal value with its specific interpretation. This essentially gives us a floating point, a decimal approximation of the actual answer. Yes, by just doing these couple of steps that seem very strange. In fact, some of these are non-standard and may break, you know, depending on what computer and what compiler you're actually using. Now, the number we have here is considered a fair approximation, but what the original creators of this have done is they've taken this one step further by applying Newton's method. This is a mathematical method to, well, make your approximation just a little bit better. And yeah, that's what they've done in this context. For this to work well, you have to start with a good initial guess, and that will be the value of y we have here. Every time you do this, you're supposed to get a better result, and you can actually apply this multiple times to get a better and better result, though in this particular case, for this particular implementation, they've only run Newton's method once, and they're happy enough with the result. I realize I didn't actually return the result, so yeah, let's just go ahead and do that real quick and pretend I didn't forget. Of course, you need to return the result, and that would be the end of it. That gives you the answer. Again, really interesting because this entire method is just hack after hack after hack. And well, it actually gives you results that are pretty good. The error you get out of using this method is actually surprisingly low. And yeah, as you can see what I have here is a graph. And well, you can see that the deviation isn't actually that much from the actual ground truth value. So yeah, there you go, very, very interesting process. And that goes to show the creativity and talent of some of the programmers out there. It's about thinking out of the box if you want to do something quick. That's all there is for this episode of Friday Minis. I hope you gained some insight today. But until next time, you're watching 0612 TV with nerdfirst.net. Thank you very much for watching. If you like my work and are feeling generous, you can shoot me a one-time donation on PayPal or sign up for a recurring one on Patreon. Of course, you can simply like, comment and subscribe. You know the deal. For more videos, links to my channel and a related playlist are on screen. Thank you for your support.